behind us with Associate Mountain and Mount Bullion, as well as other hillsides in this area, were pushed up at a roughly 45 degree angle. The forest in front of them, a large amount of loose debris and rubble, such as ancient sea dead and any other rock from further below the surface. And between the hard rock of the mountains behind us and the soft, loose debris that we're standing in, the Comstock Fault would form in this area. This fault line would allow geothermal water being superheated by shallow magma chambers under the surface to temperatures of well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or literally hot enough to carry with it vaporized gold and silver in solution. As this water worked its way through a high pressure underneath and throughout the fault line in this area, as it would get shallower and shallower on the surface, temperatures would decrease enough to allow both gold and silver and a few other minerals to precipitate out of solution with the water and form the ore bodies here underneath Virginia City, while the water itself would exhaust out of the surface in large geysers or run back down the hillsides and hot springs. Now skipping ahead to 40,000 years ago during the last glacial period, as glaciers began to recede from the Virginia City area here, uh, ore bodies that came closest to the surface containing predominantly gold would begin to erode as glaciers as it began to recede. That would cause gold to break free and wash into Six Mile Canyon across the way from us and out into the Dayton Valley you see to the east as well as to Gold Canyon to the south. Now by 1850, miners and prospectors were going through the Dayton Valley on what was then known as the California Trail, which was used to enforce joint the first year prior to 1849. So wherever there was a creek or a stream, prospectors would usually get out their gold pans. They'd wear, do a little bit of panning around here and there. Other settlers were too, just to see what they can find. And you guessed it, by 1850, gold was discovered in the Dayton area. However, nobody really paid much attention to this discovery. For their other mining communities in California where everybody would spend all their savings just to get to and gold strike was found, they'd move there and about two or three months later after they got there, gold would run out and they'd have to pack it and leave again. It was kind of thought that if anybody was really serious about the um, Six Mile Canyon area, the same would be as well. It wasn't until about 1856 until a discovery of fairly decent gold ores was discovered at a place called Johnstown, today known as Silver City, in the middle of Gold Canyon to the southwest. Now, encouraged miners by 1859 to work higher up in the Virginia City area where they discovered the source directly at the surface by that year. Now, skipping ahead to the mid 1860s, mines had started to go further and further beneath the surface uh, out under here. Uh, they started to go to levels past 700 feet below the surface and of course on their way down they were encountering a few local springs in the area which was no big deal to deal with the water in the mines all they'd have to do is dig a shallow drainage tunnel and let it run back down the hillsides but the further and further down they'd start to get they'd start to encounter water that was a temperature of 130 degrees <laughs> The reason for this is we still have geothermal activity in the area today. If you go behind Mount Davidson and at the uh, north end of Washoe Valley, there is a place called Steamboat Springs, which has a hot spring which you can still go to, as well as we have geothermal power plants still in the area. So as the mines are going further and further down, they had to do something with this 130 degree water. For there were several cases where miners working underground would dig into an aquifer of this water, not knowing it was there. Through the thin wall and scald the miners inside the tunnel. Yeah. Of course, air temperatures were the same, with about 130 degrees as well. So the miners were going to work and only wear nothing more than their pants, their boots to cover their feet, and they can only work for about 15 minutes at a time as prescribed by physicians. So that way they wouldn't succumb to the side effects of heat stroke. After their 15 minute period, they'd have to stop, go to a cool room higher in the mine where they'd get large amounts of ice water to drink, they'd sit there and rest as other miners would take their place for the next 15 minutes. They'd alternate back and forth like this for their entire eight hour shift. And be wore out when they were done. <laughs> so, to deal with this large amount of water, uh, there was a solution to the problem. Large steam powered pump engines, known as Cornish pumps, originally developed in Cornwall, England for the use of coal mines, were of course brought here to the Virginia City area and assembled to, of course, drain the water from the mines. I have a photograph of one right here. This is the uh, pump engine located at the Union Mine, or was located at the Union Mine directly behind Virginia City Cemetery. This machine was absolutely massive, as you can see the small man standing by the hub of the 40 foot diameter flywheel. So we begin to pass the photograph around so you can get a closer look at it. That's just crazy. The machine itself was originally constructed in about 1879 and cost $300,000 in 1870s money to reassemble. Of course, today that would be a couple of million, and of course, $300,000 today can barely buy you a house in this area. Right. Yeah. So, as I was about to add, that machine was capable of pumping about 2 million gallons of water in a 24 hour period. However, in order for it to function, since it was steam operated, its main fuel source was wood from the Lake Tahoe area, and that machine would go through about 20 to 30 cords of wood in a 24 hour period to operate. 
for support of wood selling in the mid 1870s mm -hmm. for seven dollars a port. It was quite expensive to operate. Oh, wow. We had about ten to fifteen of those machines here in the Virginia City area of different sizes. Wow! So as you can imagine, the pumping operation was quite costly. So another solution to cheapen the drainage of water here in Virginia City was introduced by the man named Adolf Sutro. We actually have a photograph of him here on the poster. Adolf Sutro was originally from northern Germany. He had come here to the United States with his brother Otto by about 1850. And of course he got to the San Francisco area where he'd end up starting shops where he'd sell predominantly tobacco to miners as well as other supplies as well. By 1860 he'd come to the Virginia City area to see if he could start another branch of store up here, if there's anything else he could get involved in. And of course by the late 1860s he decided, considering the large amounts of water being found underneath Virginia City, well, why don't I just dig a large drainage tunnel running from the Dayton Valley here underneath Virginia City at the 1,600 foot level below the surface to act as a large bathtub drain. And that's what he did. So by 1869, he'd start construction of his tunnel, and by 1878, he'd finished its completion. Unfortunately, the tunnel was a little bit late in Virginia City's history. For the late 1870s, high-grade ore bodies that were discovered early on in 1860 started to become more and more depleted as time went on. Of course, Mr. Sutro, noticing this and the imminent and, and impending decline of Virginia City, would sell off his stocks and his tunnel company once he'd completed it. He'd take the finances, he'd go back to San Francisco, where of course he'd build Sutro Heights, the Sutro Bass, which were a swimming pool arrangement on the coastline. He'd even become mayor of San Francisco in the 1890s as well. So, that is a very brief summary of more or less the condensed history of Virginia City. Very condensed. You know, yeah, right. For another five or six hours. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, at this point, I'll begin to take you around to the entrance of the tunnel, since that's what you paid for. Fantastic. Are you ready? Ready? Hats yeah. on backwards? So you don't squash your melon in here. Uh, do that enough. <laughs> okay, we're headed in. So were miners shorter back then or Kind of tight in here. A little claustrophobia going on. I think he talked about that out front. I hope that coat shows up on camera. <laughs> Ryan just bumped his squash. I'm be honest, I already know I don't want to spend all day working down here. Oh, they weren't thinking of me when they built this tunnel. Yeah. 
I'll go behind you here. Oh, you can stand right up in here. Come here right there. So, congratulations. We've all now made it back the short remaining 450 feet we have left of our mine. We are now 100 feet below the surface. And as my running joke goes, welcome to my apartment. <laughs> I'd see that one still gets a few giggles every now and again. So this larger underground room in which we're standing in is what is known as a stope. That is spelled S-T-O-P-E. Now a stope in the miner's dictionary is basically a term for this room that has been cavitated out because of course mineral bearing material had been found in this area and extracted leaving this larger cavity behind. Now originally when the miners first came here to Virginia City, they were after gold. That's what they'd found directly at the surface. But as they started to dig in, um, started digging a few feet below, they started to find these strange dark black sands and this really odd blue clay. And this clay was everywhere. It was always to where gold was, so they knew some was in it. They'd take this clay, the miners would run it through their little gold pans or through their sluice boxes. No luck, the clay would wash anything else out with it. They'd try to take some of this clay and send it to mills for processing, but no luck, it would jam the milling equipment up as well. So, not knowing what else to do with the material, they take it and usually throw it over the dumps of the mines or throw it back into the streets of Virginia City, thinking nothing much more of it as a street filler. Now, in 1864, a sample of these clays were taken to Grass Valley in California where assays were conducted. It would turn out for one ton of the material thrown in the streets by the miners, they'd be throwing away $450 worth of gold and silver. Oh, wow. For this mysterious blue clay, it was actually silver ore all along. <clears throat> so, once they had gotten word back from Grass Valley, the miners ran directly back in the streets of Virginia City, peeled the streets back out again, and began to process the clay in brand new mills. So literally, the streets of Virginia City in some places were paved with silver. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, today with us, um, quite a bit of those really high quality ores have been taken out of the section of the mine. We do have some samples of it left in the wall here. Uh, however, it's been drying out as time has progressed, so it's a little more of a dark and dull gray. Actually, we'll have a sample. I'll just peel right on out and pass around to you. Well, I had a better piece around here somewhere. Please do talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Come on. There we go. So this is mining. Uh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so as you can see here with my flashlight, that light blue to dark gray color is more or less I the silver it. ore that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, huh? So I guess. Mm. Any yellow streaks that you see in it happens to be um, sulfur that forms along in the mixture as well. Cool. Now this material is what is known as silver sulfide. Silver sulfide is a compound of, of course, silver and sulfur mixed together. Mm -hmm. Now, um, usually that compound is a dark black in nature. Um, but with a little bit of other minerals, it has more of a light hue, blue hue to dark gray, depending. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, this ore is probably of a very low grade, thus why it's been left in the wall more or less today, where it might not be worth the time to bring back out and process, considering how much silver is in it. Now, to extract said material, well, you wouldn't just reach into the wall and pull <laughs> out handfuls like I just did. Miners would use picks and shovels to, of course, take it out of the wall. Now, if they're in areas of harder rock, then different tools were necessary for swinging a pick into hard rock will get you nowhere very quickly. So the miners had to drill holes into the wall and blast the material out. And in order to drill the holes, the miners were using little iron bars like the one I have here. This tool is what is known as a drill steel. It has a chiseled end forged in the very end of it, which will allow a miner to take it in hand like so. He'd hold the chiseled end directly against the hard rock with a handheld hammer. He'd strike the very end of the tool, forcing it into the rock, causing it to chip away a small piece. He'd then give it a quarter of a turn. He'd strike it again. He'd give it another quarter of a turn, and he'd strike it again. He'd continue this process until the chiseled end began to bore out a round hole, which would proceed further and further into the rock. Of course, once he was done, he'd remove the tool, remove the chippings, and of course, place an explosive agent to blast away the material. Now, as this part of the tour, this is the hands-on part of said tour, but you can pass that around if you like. Unfortunately, it's the only hands-on part of the tour. <laughs> now, if a hole of greater depth was necessary than what that drill steel would provide, then a much longer one was, of course, used. One of about this size right here. Now, this particular drill steel had been held by an individual miner whose task was to hold the chiseled end directly against the rock like so, or if he was in a kneeling position, he'd be resting it over his shoulder like I'm doing. Mm. Now, if I was the miner holding this tool, directly behind me would be another man with a much larger sledgehammer right here, whose job was to strike the very small end of this tool, forcing it into the rock. Now, the miners were exceptionally skilled at what they did, so it was rare for the man holding this tool to be severely injured in the process. 
However, the miners were also taking turns at this work, which meant if you were to miss and strike the man holding this tool, the next chance he got, he'd most likely get even more <laughs> in the process. Uh -huh. Now, to make this work a little more challenging, the miners here in Virginia City were using predominantly candles for their lighting. Even though oil lamps were available, candles were preferred in this area, for the vast majority of the mines under Virginia City itself were held up with large amounts of timbering like this one here. So if you were to drop and spill your oil lamp, well that could spell disaster and fire. So if you were to say drop a candle you had lit, it'd simply land on the ground, you could pick it back up again, no harm done. Or of course the candle would blow out or go out once it made contact with the ground. So the candles themselves are placed in iron candle holders like the one that I have here. That can be inserted anywhere into the rock and the working surface as seen fit, or hooked to surfaces as convenient as well. Now as part of the tour, I'll give you a demonstration as to what this candle light would have looked like. So with my not so authentic lighter, I will give you said demonstration. So with the candle now lit, now if the light's out, well, this is it. This is the light in which the miners had to work with for that eight hour shift I mentioned. Thank yeah. God. Now, fortunately for the miners working underground, each man was usually given three candles of about one foot in length that when burned one at a time would last them their entire eight hour shift they worked underground. So it wasn't just one individual man had one candle. If there were other miners working in this area. There'd be several other candles for the rest of the scope and it would be a bit brighter to see in the course. Mm -hmm. So now I'll take the candle and place it directly into the rock. I'll begin to chip and chisel away. How many people were working down here at a time? Well, on a small stope like this, you wouldn't probably have more than about five miners working here. Uh, the mines usually had shifts of about 20 to 30 miners working for them. Of course, many of the mines ran 24 hours a day, gotcha. which basically meant 90 miners working for one outfit. So if any of you are interested in doing the touristy thing of taking a photograph of this candle, if you are interested, feel free to. The flash on your phone will not be necessary. Of course, I'll illuminate the way partially back there for anyone to see. Any takers? Yes? No? Maybe? All right. I think we got her. All right. So at this point, if the candle were to say go out, well, this yeah. is pretty much what you'd be left in. Yeah. Now, fortunately, by the 1900s, electricity had started to be introduced into mines nationwide, so of course electricity was brought in to illuminate underground workings. Electric trams were also brought in to, of course, replace mules that hauled carts in and out of the mines. Even the newest of telecommunications started to make it in. So in this little iron lockbox, sponsored by Western Electric, its manufacturer, I actually have a telephone for underground use. Wow. Now, interestingly enough about these telephones, even though they were brand new and worked perfectly fine when they left the factory, once installed underground, it was reported they'd only work about 50% of the time. The reason for this is dirt and moisture would get into them, causing the components serious damage, or the lines running in and out of the mine would, of course, also be damaged as well. So again, the phones only worked about 50% of the time, even when brand new. Mm. Top of the phone, we have our little rubber rat here. Kind of squeaks a little bit. Why we have this little rubber rat here is rats were intentionally introduced into the mines as cave in detection. Um, of course, once rats had begun to uh, spread their population through the mines, uh, if there was a cave in in one section of the particular area, usually whatever rats were in that area would run out to, of course, preserve their own lives. Mm -hmm. And their mass exodus would alert the miners to get out of that section of the mine as well, or to stay out from that tunnel which the rats were running from. So, rats were our cave in detection. Mm. So And cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, very latecomers. Yeah. Uh, feel free to stand around in here somewhere. So, at this point, I've given the exceptionally brief summary of this little corner. Do we have any other questions before I go behind where they are standing now and explain a few more things? Yes? No? Maybe? I think we're good. No? Not even questions like where the miners go to the bathroom? It's a very popular question with the kids, I assure mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Okay, so where do they go to the bathroom? All right, since now I brought it up, <laughs> I forced you to ask the question. <laughs> uh, so it, you could, yes, in theory, go in a discarded candle box or a black powder tin, but that doesn't get the waste or smell out of the mine. Uh, you could dig, say, an underground outhouse, but again, that doesn't get rid of the smell since you're in a very confined space. Right. So a solution to the waste problems was to basically take the wheels and axles from out underneath discarded ore carts that were no longer being used. The mines would take these wheel sets and build on top of them a large wooden watertight box or iron box. And on top of that box were two little toilet seats bolted side by side with no divider, and they had toilet carts, literally a portable porta potty. Mm -hmm. They actually do have a toilet cart outside of the mine. It's the cart with the two hatches on top outside the entrance of the mine itself. Aww. We've seen that in the 
one of the other ones, yeah. And as you guessed it, tradition dictated the new guy got to empty it at the end of the day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the new guy. So, at this point, I'll go behind and explain a few more things. So, directly where you were standing, actually, you can probably stop places over here. This small little shaft we have here is what is known as a winz. That is spelled W-I-N-Z-E. Winzes are shafts that are dug specifically underground to continue to levels found directly below us. Now, miners would have originally used ladders to get to the bottom of this winz, while these two large wood beams I have here are guides for a much larger iron bucket directly above us. Now, once this bucket was filled with material, it'd be raised to this point and dumped out into the waiting carts on our track below us. So we follow the cable up past our little pulley, and directly behind us, we have in the back here a hoist that runs off of compressed air to do the job of raising and lowering said bucket. Now, as one miner would be operating the hoist and two or three other men below filling the bucket, if they were to yell up to the hoist operator something like, Hey, Jim, raise the bucket. Well, Jim, unfortunately, wouldn't be able to hear them, especially if yeah. they're 20 to 30 feet down. Nor would tying a note to a rock and throwing it 30 feet straight back up, that wouldn't work too terribly well either. So a solution to this communication problem, which was also used in the main shafts that went down 1,000 feet below the surface of Virginia City, the miners were given these iron bells to communicate with. So a rope would have attached to our ringer running down the length of the winds so the miner can ring out the appropriate bell code to tell the hoist operator what to do. Directly behind the bell, I have a chart of bell codes. So for example, one ring of the bell is stop, two rings of the bell is lower conveyance, three rings of the bell is raise conveyance or raising and lowering the bucket and so on. Further below, we have the code for emergency, which is nine rings of this bell in quick succession, indicating that miners below were in need of immediate assistance or were severely injured as well. Now the next thing I'll probably get into is at some point one or two or three or four of you or all of you by the time I'm done mentioning it will most likely end up asking me what's back in there. What's in this dark and spooky section of mine? Are we going any back any further? What's in there? What are you hiding from us? <laughs> well to answer any and all of those questions unfortunately we have 10 feet of more or less a collapsed tunnel. Now this part of the mine probably would have gone back another 500 feet into the solid rock of Mount Davidson behind us. And believe it or not, at one time our mine had 14 miles of tunnel to it originally, as well as the main shaft that went down 1,600 feet roughly below the surface there near the tunnel level. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the mines here in Virginia City, as I mentioned, were held up with large amounts of wood timbering. And of course, as time has begun to progress, many of those timbers, of course, have decayed, causing collapses. So out of the 750 miles of tunnel we used to have here underneath Virginia City, I guarantee you probably only about 40% of them are still open in places wow. today. So, is the same, that's the same case with our mine. Now, believe it or not, in the mid-1980s, there was an attempt to actually expand the tour back some more distance to give it, you know, more length to her, more interest. So the former owner of this mine had actually gotten a local mining contractor and a bit of a budget developed, and they managed to start to work their way further and further back the original line of this tunnel. They managed to go back another 100 feet where they actually found a stope three times the size of the one we're standing in, which was fantastic to have on the tour. The room was literally about 20 feet in height by about an hour 60 feet in diameter. Again, fantastic to have on the tour. The only problem was all the old <coughs> timbering that was supposed to be holding that stope up were now in a nice, neat little rotted pile on the floor. So as they'd come in, they'd start to excavate that part of the stope to try to at least stabilize it. They'd leave after their day's work, they'd come back in the next day, and they'd find about three feet of the ceiling laying back down on the floor again. So as time began to progress, the budget began to dwindle, and one of the final straws of going back any further is when the contractor himself almost got caught in a small cave-in. So they decided, that's it, 10 feet is good enough. Yeah. So we have the 10 feet of what could have been. As I guarantee you, most likely next year we'll take one of our carts like we have outside, shove it back in there with a Halloween skeleton, and we'll have something for you to look at next year. <laughs> now the last thing that I'll get into before I let you disperse and look around and take pictures of this and that and the other, and ask as many questions as you like, but there are several. In this very back corner where you two are standing, I'll trade places with you again. We have our display of pneumatic drills or compressed air drills, similar to the machine gun looking thing you may have seen outside on the tripod. Now these machines were originally introduced nationwide by about 1872 and were originally steam operated. However, many of these drills were converted from steam to compressed air, or steam has a tendency to prevent the long hose line to air compressed air as much. 
That's the way we came in. So is that working? Yeah. You can see air coming out of it now. So that wouldn't be here. A large amount of hard rock dust when inhaled by the miners would give them the disease of miners' consumption or silicosis as it is known. Part of it is similar to coal um, black lung found in coal mines. Rocks so in the box. So prolonged exposure to these machines, many miners would begin to die of that disease, giving the machines thereafter the infamous nickname of Widowmakers. However, during the turn of the century, um, some of the Widowmakers were redesigned, or at least some of these pneumatic drills were redesigned, to where water lines were added to them, which would allow water to be forced through their drill steels, which were bored hollow like a gun barrel that could force water into the hole they were drilling and trap and flush out the dust before they could be inhaled by the miners, thus improving their health and safety thereafter. Now, two of these machines here, of course, are not original to the 1870s. The one where my flashlight beam is, that one's from about 1920, 1910. And the one we have over here is a more modern variant from about 1950, 1940. 1940, 1950, yeah, you get the point. So, at this point, I've given you the exceptionally brief, condensed uh, overview of what's in this tour. I will now begin to let all of you disperse and look around and take pictures of this and that and the other and ask as many questions as you like. Again, you paid for the tour, ask whatever you like, and of course, just look around thereafter. So at this point, disperse, look around, take pictures, <coughs> ask questions. So is this pine? Uh, is this timber pine? Quite a bit of it um, is a form of ponderosa pine or Douglas fir, or basically a species of a more or less evergreen. Mm -hmm. um, hardwoods weren't really used here in these mines because we didn't really have a great source of hardwood on such a pool. Okay. A wind. A wind. Yes. Well, some winds is actually were fairly shallow. This one probably only went down 20 or 30 feet. As you can see, it is well caved in and collapsed. Um, some winds is actually only went down about 12 feet. For some times, you'll come across a drift or a tunnel where exploratory work yes. was done. They'd only dig that distance down in solid rock. They wouldn't find much of anything. We'll just leave it thereafter. Mm. So, of course, that's when if you're Doing the thing of exploring abandoned mines, you do have to be careful for some of these can be hiding around the corner. They just, you know, walked around the left. So, mm -hmm. Can you shine your flashlight back down there? Oh, I yeah. want to see it. Oh, yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So any other questions? Not even like, uh, oh, let's see, or how much gold was pulled out of this mine? Yes, no, there was a next question. question. Yeah. 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 Well, the one thing I will mention is if you're reading a history book here on Virginia City, do take the numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, many of the numbers were, um, of course, exaggerated sometimes by local newspapers to kind of up the production of the mines when they weren't doing so well. Stock prices. Um, I will also mention some of the mines if you get an actual paper from, say, the Savage Mining Company, that would be the most accurate source, but you'd have to adjust the number for inflation today. Now, if you read a history book, say, from 1949, the number may have been taken from the original 1870s quote, or also may have been adjusted for 1940s inflation. So, again, do take the numbers. Um, I have read an actual source from this mine, um, published um, by Isaac Requa, who is the superintendent of this mine from about 1865 to well into 1875, so about 10 years. Um, he had noted that the records of this mine from 1859, when William Collar originally owned it, to about 1872, this mine had produced $16 million worth of gold and silver, and it was expected to produce another $2 million each year thereafter. Um, of course, you adjust that for inflation today, that $16 million is at least a couple billion today. Um, Thank you, Dan. <laughs> well, there's several other things you can mention. I mean, you don't just need to stand here in this quiet and dark room. I don't. I don't know what what else to ask. Do you like long walks on the beach, or do you like long walks on the beach? Are you single? Are you? <laughs> As you were about to say, said, ask anything. Right as of today, if you own property, at least in the state as justified by the state of Nevada, if you own property, more or less, you get to own the mineral, right, mineral rights underneath your house, too. Mm. Uh, the biggest reason for all of this was <coughs> back then in 1875, yes, you can own a property a lot, but there might be a mining company who's working right next to you and they'd have the mineral rights because they'd gotten there first. Mm. Um, but as time began to progress, 
Say, for example, it's 1950 and you're in Virginia City and you own an 1870s house that an 1870s mining company worked under. That company was probably well long gone and defunct, so it wouldn't really make sense for you not to have the mineral rights underneath your own property. So after a certain point, if you are a property owner, your mineral rights do get transferred to you if no mining company is using it. So I think there's a time limit on that. I can't remember quite exactly what. All right, did you guys learn anything? <laughs> I thought he did a bit, really good job. He did. He did a he, great job. He did. He did really good. I think this video is probably gonna run a little bit long because we did the whole tour in there. So, but it's history. To it is history it. to watch it. Yes, it's good. Make your kids well, watch actually, it. I guess if you're seeing this part, make your kids watch it because you've already made it to this part. You've already seen it all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Remember, just be you.